yeah, I'll push you. A 500 mile journey. There were moments where we literally thought, like, we're done. That forged a friendship and strengthened faith. God was with us every step of the way. Plus, a boy killed in a car crash until a miracle brings him back. Find out who he met in heaven on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Seven-year-old Liam has reason to celebrate. Last year, doctors discovered an aggressive brain tumor and gave him little chance of surviving the year. But just last week, this young fighter from Maine received his final treatment. And during the past few months, Liam captured the hearts of community members, including the local police. Before that final hospital visit, his mom noticed five police cruisers in the family's driveway. The sheriff's department wanted to give him a lift. His mother was moved by the good deed. Yeah, I cried a little bit, though. Um, just to see how many people came out to support him and show their love for him was, people it was love really me. touching. People love me. And I think he's done so much for our community and for all of us. Yes, he's doing awesome. I'm good. I <laughs> am. I love the Batman mask. Well, a child's first year of life is full of milestones. And if you're a parent, you probably remember your child's first birthday cake. Well, one mother in Jacksonville, Florida, didn't have the opportunity to celebrate her son's first birthday. So she did something a little different on what would have been his special day. A grocery chain employee described his encounter with a woman on Facebook. She then started to tear up and tell me that she had a stillborn child a year ago. And in tribute, she wanted to pay for someone else's cake. He went on to say, she told me thank you and appreciated that I let her do this. It was probably one of the most touching things I've seen in all my years working in retail. I hope that this lady finds peace through this tribute and that the customer receiving this gift will, if nothing else, Pay it forward. What a great tribute. Well, even as temperatures drop, free ice cream is always in season. It's an idea that sounds so good. A Minnesota woman built a pay it forward business out of it. Stacy Achterhoff is known around Duluth as Mrs. Delicious. She owned a bike cart, cart ice cream business and got the idea after a man approached her and wanted to buy ice cream, not for himself, but for others. Well, she posted the good deed on Facebook, and soon after, donations came flooding in from others wanting to pay it forward. Well, now she offers free ice cream, and most customers are quick to donate right back. And she re recently told KARE News, people want to know that goodness is prevailing over evil, and they want to be a part of that. And what a wonderful thing. Yes, indeed, goodness, light always overcomes the darkness. Well, the sport of ice hockey, while popular in the United States, is most prominent in Canada and Eastern Europe. You might be surprised to learn that the African Republic of Kenya has a hockey team, one team, and that makes playing games a bit of a challenge. That is until international fast food restaurant Tim Hortons and a couple of the NHL's best stepped in to help. I had no idea what ice hockey was. I saw guys playing a game, but I couldn't understand how they were moving. They were like sliding, that was not running. And it was my dream to one day move like them. We took it upon ourselves to start recruiting Kenyans playing ice hockey. I had to try out something new. Ice hockey is fun because when you're in the rink, nothing matters. The whole world stops. We're actually like the pioneers of ice hockey in Kenya. Canada is the home of hockey. Any hockey player would love to have the Canada experience. It was all amazing seeing our jerseys hanging all around. It's a great day for us. It's a dream to be in Canada, 
to play our first game in full gear, it's all amazing. So let's try our best, let's push hard, and everything will fall our way. Sydney, seeing my favorite player coming through the door wearing our jersey, I felt like I was in heaven. It's such an honor for them to do this for us. I can't hold back my tears. We get to compete against another team. You know, we used to playing against ourselves. I've never had so much fun like in my entire life. That's the best part about the game, is just how it reaches so many people and a place like Kenya where you wouldn't think that there's even ice. I didn't really know what to expect, but I thought those guys looked great. It's cool to see the genuine excitement that they had, and it got us really fired up. To meet people from different places and to share the game that we love to play, I think I had just as much fun as any of those guys did today. We thank Tim Hortons for believing in us. The support that we're given will help us grow the sport in Kenya. Well, up next, a five-week pilgrimage and a 40-year friendship. I said, hey, do you want to go across 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And his answer was, yeah, I'll push you. It was just one more opportunity to build more memories. Watch these fast friends relive their incredible journey right after this. Justin and Patrick have been friends for 40 years. So when Justin decided he wanted to complete a 500-mile hike, well, Patrick was eager to go and instantly said, I'll push you. If you have those moments in your life where you just know inside and out, it's something you're supposed to do. I just knew, I just knew. For Justin Skisuck, it would be the epic adventure he and lifelong friend Patrick Ray had talked about for years. A 500 mile trek on the legendary El Camino de Santiago. For centuries, people have been making the pilgrimage that traces the steps of James the Apostle, from the foot of the French Pyrenees to the Santiago de Compostela Cathedral on the west coast of Spain. Every year, roughly 250,000 hike the trail, but very few do it in a wheelchair. I said, hey, do you want to go across 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And his answer was, yeah, I'll push you. I didn't have any other thought than, yeah, I'll push you, because we've, we've just shared so much of life together, and it was just one more opportunity to build more memories. It's a friendship that started 40 years ago. Together, they have supported one another through tournaments, graduations, milestones, and even disease. In 2004, Justin was diagnosed with multifocal acquired motor axonopathy an autoimmune disease that has slowly robbed him of all of his motor skills and will eventually take his life. It has left him completely dependent on his wife, Kirsten, for daily care. But Patrick didn't give it a second thought. We didn't think about the challenge. We had no idea how difficult it was gonna be. <laughs> it was just, okay, the decision's been made. It's important to him, so it's important to me. We'll figure it out. The hike is a five-week trek that traverses mountains, rivers, and desert. Training and preparing for the trip would take two years. Overcoming the doubt that crept in every now and then took prayer. Pat would be completely freaked out. I would be more calm and just kind of like, okay, we're gonna get through this. And then, you know, I would be then freaked out and then he would be calm. And so, luckily we were never in the same cycle together. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we were on yeah. like two hamsters on wheels, but they were going at different paces. So we yeah. Got different points at different points in time. But we had never, we never prayed so hard, I think, no. ever ever um, together. 
Then, in June of 2014, they said goodbye to their families in Boise, Idaho, and boarded their flight to Paris, France. With them was a film crew documenting their journey to raise awareness for Justin's disease. Two days later, as they made their way up the Pyrenees Mountains, reality set in. The trail consistently pitches one way or the other, and so we're always on a little bit of an angle to the right or the left, and so Justin's constantly having to move back and forth to shift his weight while communicating to me what he's gonna see coming up. Come on, come on. We had some very steep declines, and we had safety harnesses attached to me, and they'd have to, two or three people would have to get behind Patrick. Stop. Stop, Pat. Pat, stop. I've stopped. Okay, back, back up. Back, okay. Okay. I'm tilted. My wheelchair weighs about 250 pounds yeah. with me in it and the weight of gear and, and the chair itself and whatnot, so it's quite, it's quite heavy, and it'll pull you straight down, straight down the hill, and it's very slow moving going up. One, two, three. This way. There were moments where we literally thought this might be it for the day. Like, I, like we're done. Mechanical malfunction. Oh, oh gosh. It's hard not to feel like a burden in this. Got it? Oh, I'm cramping. <sighs> and I, I don't know how much time he has. You know. It's really hard to let somebody do that for you. But as only good friends can, they kept each other going. Yo, what's up, bro? <laughs> the dynamics that we just kind of just embrace, vulnerability, accountability, really being honest with each other, kind of unabashed honesty about where we're at, what we feel. Um, if we don't agree with something, just throwing it all out there and being okay, A, saying it, and B, being okay, receiving it has just created this, this dynamic that exists where there's no fear. There's no fear within our relationship. And that, I think, is, is where God has really been able to mold us into kind of a one unit. We both took our expectations off the table, and however that played out is however it played out. And if he just needed a listening ear, it was listening ear. If he needed somebody to laugh with, somebody to laugh with. If he needs somebody to cry with, he needs somebody to cry with. I just wanted to be there for him. Okay, seriously, dude, it's time to walk. <laughs> I'm just faking it, guys. <laughs> but their honesty and trust wasn't the only thing that got them through the journey. God is with us every step of the way. There we go. Someone will show up out of nowhere. <laughs> High five. <laughs> yeah, those, you, know, you call them angels, and whether they're angels or not, you know, I don't know, but they're... The people that God's using. We met people from 27 countries. We had over 100 people help us. So I think about that, at least 100 moments or periods of time where people were placed in our path for a reason. With God and the help of complete strangers, Justin and Patrick finished their pilgrimage in 35 days. Looking back, they have come to appreciate their friendship even more. For them, it's not about sacrifice or humility. It's about love. This whole journey has revealed to me the, the truth that we are so much better together than we are alone. We're meant to live life together, and that's where God calls us to be. It's way more exciting, way more fun, pushes you in ways you never thought you could go or who you could be as a person. So often, the beauty that, that God wants us to see is within one another. The opportunity for provision is in one another. The opportunity for experiencing God's love is through the love He's pouring into our wife or our husband or our children. It's community. It's embracing others and loving them in a, just a recklessly, you know, passionate way. Since returning from Spain, Justin and Patrick founded Push Inc., an organization that helps groups and individuals achieve their dreams. Together, the two have co-written their first book, inspired audiences as motivational speakers, and are eagerly awaiting the documentary aptly titled, I'll Push You, which will be released this October. You can see God at work. You can. 
you can see God at work right in front of us. When you ask God to take control of your life, <laughs> hold on because you're in for a wild ride. Underlines, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. That's the love that God has for us, and that was the love displayed just then. Well, still ahead, an eight-year-old wakes up from a coma and then tells his mom some stunning news. I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. Stay tuned to see what happens next after this. A recent Barna study found that most Americans still believe in miracles, with over a quarter of those surveyed believing that the miraculous healing isn't just something they say may be true, it's something they've experienced firsthand. Well, we want to show you the miraculous story of Landon Whitley. Landon was just eight years old when he was driving home from church with his family when their car was crushed at an intersection by an ambulance. Well, Landon's dad died at the scene, and so did Landon. Take a look. I didn't see what he was yelling at. I didn't see the ambulance coming, but I remembered him yelling. That was the last thing I heard from him. On a Sunday morning in 1997, Julie Kemp, her husband Andy, and their eight-year-old son Landon were driving home from church when an ambulance returning to its station broadsided their car in an intersection. Andy died instantly. Rescuers stabilized Julie, but did not realize there was a third passenger in the car. They couldn't see his body because of the damage that was done to the driver's side of the car, and Landon was sitting behind his dad. And when they saw Landon's shoe, it took a deeper search for his body. When they pulled Landon out um, from the back of the car, he was not breathing. And they all started working on him right away to bring him back. Landon was resuscitated and life flighted to Carolina's medical center. He died two more times that day, and both times he was brought back to life. Doctors didn't give Julie much hope for his survival. They told me that if he lived, which did not look good, but that if he lived, that he would be like an eight-year-old baby, that um, he would not know how to walk or talk or to eat. I was so desperate that that was okay. I would take that just to have him. He was all that I had. At her husband's funeral, Julie remembers feeling abandoned by God. I was very disappointed, heartbroken. And while I'm sitting at the funeral, I'm fussing at God. I don't understand um, why this happened. I don't understand um, why he didn't send angels to protect us. But in the very next breath, I'm praying as hard to him as I've ever prayed in my life for Landon to live. Landon had suffered massive head trauma during the accident and remained in a coma. He's hooked up to all kinds of machines to keep him alive. And there are no signs. There's nothing good or bad. They see nothing happening. I kept praying that he would open his eyes. After two weeks in a coma, Landon opened his eyes. To everyone's amazement, he had no brain damage. But in the midst of her joy, Julie knew she had to tell Landon about his father. He had scars on his face, and his head was just full of hurt. And I didn't want to hurt him anymore. So I asked Landon, I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. Landon is now grown, but still clearly remembers his amazing experiences in heaven. I remember being able to see my dad and his friend, Olin Palmer, who had passed away less than a month before he did, also in a car accident, and Olin's son, Neil Palmer, who had died on a four-wheeler years before. Never one of us said a word to each other, but we were just all standing there. 
he looked over to me and says, oh, mom, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I saw your other two kids. And I just looked at him because um, I, I wasn't sure what he was talking about, but um, I had two miscarriages before Landon was born. We had never shared that with Landon. He did not know that um, we had lost two children before him. I knew that they were my siblings, even though no one had ever told me about them. Just being in heaven, I, I guess you know, you know your own or you know who everyone is. He says each time he died, he had a different experience in heaven. During the third time, he says he met Jesus and was given a mission. It was almost as if like um, a preview of a movie to where you only get to see certain bits and pieces of things. Jesus came to me and told me that I have to go back to earth and be a good Christian and tell others about him. Today, through Grief Share, Landon and Julie use their story to help others who are struggling with loss and in need of hope. I didn't understand in 1997, you know, why God didn't send an angel, but I know that there were angels there, and I know that um, we were protected, and we are living out what His plan is for us. Instead of staying mad at Him, I was able to use the story to help others not to give up and to um, keep their faith on their grief journey. I just want people to realize that Jesus is real. There is a heaven, there are angels, and um, to follow his word in the Bible, and life does get better at the end. In her book, Faith Has Its Reasons, Julie says God has used their experience to bring others closer to him and has brought new blessings to them. It is a huge blessing that I get to watch my child tell others about Jesus. He is always willing to let others know that there is a heaven because he's been there. I know I'm doing it for Jesus. I know that he's real. I know that angels are there. I know that there's a heaven. I'm not doing it for someone who I don't know or I've never seen. I've seen Jesus. I know he's there. He's asked me to do this, and this is what I'm doing. The story underlines that so often we don't understand. And why wasn't an angel sent to stop, to intervene? Uh, you're literally talking moments of time. Uh, could there have been a delay leaving church? Here you have a wonderful family. They're doing the right thing. It's Sunday morning. They're on their way home from church and then suddenly tragedy strikes them. And it's the age-old question, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, it's another age-old philosophical question. It's called the question of evil. Why is there evil in the world? But in those times and in that grief, instead of getting mad at God, realize that God has already taken care of it, he already has a heaven for us. All he's doing is waiting for us to get there. Jesus said something very mysterious, and, and it's, it's one of the verses that puzzles me. In this life, you will have trouble. And then he says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, in the midst of your grief, if you've lost a loved one, if you've had an accident, if bad things have happened to you, don't turn away from the source of all the blessings that can come your way. Don't turn away from the one who can be the answer. He said, yes, you're going to have trouble in this world, in this life, in this uh, epoch, if you will. We're going to have trouble, but we need to be of good cheer, for he has overcome that. And wherever you stand in that journey with him, and whether the answer to your prayer comes now or comes in heaven, realize that he is able to work all things together for your good. So what, when you're tempted to be mad at God for what's happened, when you're tempted to say, I want to turn away, if this is, if this is what it means, then I want to turn away. Where else can you go? because he is the one who has the words of life. 
If you're going through a time of grieving and you just want to pour out your heart, let someone pray for you. We're here for you. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. And here's a word for you. And just believe in this. There is hope for tomorrow. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. For all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.